Leute, könnt ihr es noch glauben? Oder könnt ihr es glauben, es gibt noch Videos von Aaron Jones, äh, die hier noch nicht konsumiert wurden in diesem Format. Oh mein Gott, es ist Nacht, oder? Fucking Vögel. Hm. Okay, ich gehe mal kurz hier runter. Hm, weil ich habe gar keinen Bock auf diese Vögel. Und... muss kurz AFK. Ist natürlich äh, toll gelegen, dass ich zum Anfang der Folge AFK gehe. Aber ihr wisst Bescheid. Ja, ähm, also wie schon gesagt, es gibt mal wieder Aaron Jones heute zur Feier des Tages. Und zwar Programming Defensively auf dem YouTube-Channel Brian Clough. Und ja, wir sind auf Laserburg Man, ein Vanilla äh, Anarchie-Server. Äh, sprich, es gibt keine Regeln und keinerlei Administration oder Eingriff von Stuff. Und ähm, ja, hier ist selten was los, also eigentlich ist hier immer leer. Aber also hin und wieder, es schaut mindestens täglich mindestens eine Person vorbei. Das ist eigentlich eine sichere Statistik, die ich hier von meinem aktiven Spielen und ähm, ja, aufmerksamen Leben innerhalb der letzten paar Tage hier wahrgenommen habe. Ähm, also es ist eine momentan eine entspannte Situation. Ich würde hoffen, also ich versuche <lacht> das Ganze zu ändern und hier den Server ein bisschen zu beleben. Ähm, falls ihr da Ideen hat, habt zu Bewerbungsstrategien oder mich irgendwie unterstützen wollt, nur zu ähm, und sonst äh, spielt einfach auf dem Server und ähm, ja, der Server wird eine Zeit lang online bleiben und mit einer Zeit lang meine ich eigentlich richtig lange, also es ist eigentlich nicht geplant, dass der Server wieder ausgeht. Ähm, genau und gibt es noch irgendwas zu sagen? Vermutlich nicht. Ja, dann würde ich sagen, starten wir mal mit dem äh, Video von... Oh mein Gott, die Viecher. Oh mein Gott. Gut, dass ich da was eingepackt habe. Äh, aber jetzt komme ich nicht mehr hoch. Oh, warte, warte. Oh, ja, okay, ich komme da hoch. Ähm. Ne, es ist jetzt echt ungünstig. Ich glaube, ich werde die Nacht aussitzen. In einem Loch. Wie man das so macht. Weil, ja. Genau, ähm. So, was mit meinem Inventory? Sick Touch Menu. Alrighty. Dann würde ich sagen, starten wir mal das Video. Link ist wie immer in der Beschreibung. Es ist ein 2 Stunden Video. Kann gut sein, dass wir das nicht ganz in dieser Folge schaffen. Aaron Jones, Programming Defensively. Let's go. <lacht> So, von wann ist das Video? Von 2017. So, What is this? This is an introduction to ist der Upload? Heißt ja nicht, dass das ist. Äh the way we're going to start this is by starting with what this isn't. This isn't an introduction to programming. Ah, die Session war auch August 8. 17. Okay, also. Das ist ein detailed analysis on how to do things with programming. Really, what this is, is to give you all an idea of some of the dangers. Wunderbar, keine Details, nur grobes Gelaber. Das kann man sich doch super gut hier nebenbei. In addition to that, we're also going to go over a couple of other things. Uh, I'm sure everybody knows about uh, a gentleman by the name of Mr. Hutchinson. Uh, Nie gehört. He was arrested at DEF CON, um, or shortly after DEF CON. Uh, after that gentleman got arrested, there was a whole bunch of stuff that ended up in the newspaper. We're going to talk about that a little bit. He's connected in a way to uh, WannaCry and WannaCrypt, but do want to discuss that. And then for those of you who made it to last talk, we talked about things like Hansa Market, Alpha Bay, places where people are going to buy heroin online, uh, the way that they're using some of these cryptocurrencies to be able to make illicit purchases online. Uh, I want to make some announcements about what actually occurred over the past few days in relation to 
uh, some of those events. Yeah, past few days, ne? Is nicht 2020, but, sondern 2017. So at the conclusion of this course, you will be able to identify why coding is the backbone of security. You will be able to identify an organization that provides unbiased information about internet and computer applications and the security therein. You will be able to identify what phase of software development lends itself to finding vulnerabilities in the code. We will be able to talk about what is a buffer overflow and what does drive stand for. Okay. Don't repeat yourself. Oder? So, let's just start with software. Your hardware really doesn't do much for you if you don't have something to run on it. You can go out, we can buy a computer, and we can put $4,000 worth of hardware in this box, and we can plug it into the wall and give it power, and we can let it sit there. And generally, unless somebody kicks in the door and picks this thing up, <laughs> it poses no real threat to anybody, nothing bad's going to happen with it. But once we add an operating system, and once we ask that system to start doing stuff, well, that's when we start having to pay attention to it. Perhaps we're going to add a web browser, or I'm sorry, not a web browser, a web server. Uh, perhaps we're going to add a database, or we're going to have it do something. Once it starts doing something, that's when it can present a threat to us. So when I'm working with my students, in general, what I like to tell them is the techniques that we're learning, you need to be able to pay attention and learn these techniques because they will do something positive for you. But in addition to that, you need to learn how they can hurt you. We can RM a file. Take a file, we can run the command RM, and we can remove that file. That's great. No. But when you run RM, ja, oder nur ARM, ein Pfeil, das man noch braucht. Digga, haben wir alle schon gemacht. Größter Pain, yes. Oh boy, what have I lost? So we need to not only understand how the hardware works, how the software works, how all of these items come together provide us some sort of service, whatever that service happens to be. But in addition to that, we also need to make sure that we're paying attention to how these services can harm us. Oh Just wow, like I have not my slot for that Eisen. Word, right? Internet of things. Oh. Everybody's buying cameras, they're buying DVRs, they're buying drones. Drones are the big thing in the, the news right now, DJI, right? Everybody went out and bought drones, and the next thing you know, everybody's going, why is this thing connecting to China? What? Wo bin ich denn hier? Servers all over the world from this little drone that's taking pictures of the inside of oh, my house, whatever. Hier bin ich. So where's all this information actually going? But that's an invisible function, right? We buy this device and we use it, and in the background, it's doing something else. Uh, another one. Roombas. But see that? Everybody bought little robots, right? put them in their house and the robot went around and cleaned and that was super cool and super awesome. And now what are they doing? They gathered up maps of people's houses. They gathered up sensor data about the homes. They gathered up a ton of information. And again, for those of you who have previously come to my classes, what are some of the things we can do with that kind of information? Have you thought about that? We thought of, we, uh, One of the thought exercises that I gave in one of my previous classes was entropy, right? 33 bits of entropy and pretty much figure out who you are, no matter where you are or who you are. As long as I have very specific bits of information about you, even though that data is anonymous information, at a certain point with enough anonymous information, it's no longer anonymous, right? Your Roombas are doing the exact same thing. But at the end of the day, what happens? Somebody wrote a program, right? And that program was designed to do something really neat. And then they exploited it. So let's go over some code concepts first, okay? Just for those of you who are developers, who work in software, who have to do anything involving computers. The first
first thing that we need to pay attention to when we're talking about code is that code needs to be correct first. If the code can't do its job, if the expected behavior of that code is wrong, or if it's not accomplishing the mission, that's a problem, right? I see a lot of people, whenever I'm working with other developers or individuals who are dealing with code, they get into this idea that they want it to be performant. They want to use fancy tricks and neat things, right? I want to impress my peers. I want to show people how cool it is that I can use specific functions or frameworks, or I can do all of these different things without really paying attention to what's going on in the system. Now, of course, you can also take that to the extreme. Uh, case in point, at my current position, we have a piece of software that we work with. It was developed in-house. And when I got there, uh, it is a web application. And that web application loaded 649 megabytes per page load on the server side. Okay? Mm. There was composer use. There was a whole bunch of other stuff. Classic. And it's all in WordPress. And essentially, WordPress loads a whole bunch of things. <coughs> and you had all these plugins that were loading. And none of it was loaded in a way that, uh, that wasn't loaded on page load. Like, it wasn't on demand. It literally took the entire web application and just span it all up. Response time was 30 seconds. So when you would click on a page, like you click home, and it take 30 seconds, and then it would come up. Boah, so was tut einfach nur weh, so was zu verwenden. And I added op caching, operations caching. So it only loads that up one time, and it drops us down to about 0 0.5 seconds. Okay? So there's a problem with the code, but then there was a band-aid that we could apply on system side. And then once we did that, oh, we added the band -aid, now the system loads and people can actually use it. Getting fancy, trying to be impressive, adding a whole bunch of stuff on the back end, all of those things can potentially spawn problems. And in addition to that, and we'll, we'll talk about this here shortly, the more things that you add into the code, remember, those are more things that you need to check, that you need to look at, that you need to be cognizant of. For every line that's written into this thing, one more line that you have to be concerned about, right? Uh, I have a really good story about that. I worked with a gentleman who, uh, his big story was that uh, he went into a job and they used to pay by the line of code. What? Per line. That's how you got paid. What? Okay? <laughs> Sit down, and if you were writing software, you got bucks for every line of code that you wrote. This is the Obviously, concept people sat Dustin. down and write big, huge <laughs> programs to very small thing. And the guy sat down and said, you know functions, do? alles I'm going to start all this stuff out. We're factoring the code, making changes. And we're going to make it smaller, more compact, faster. We're going to do all this stuff. And he said that at the end of the day, he had pulled out thousands of lines of code and all of this stuff. And he had this huge thing. And he sent in a bill and said, for taking all this stuff out, I want even more money. Because now we're fixing your product. So... When you're sitting here coding, or when you are sitting here being a developer, remember, nobody gets paid by the line anymore. At least I hope so. <laughs> we want to make sure that what we're doing is we're writing stuff that's readable. That it's compact, that so much. That it's easy Ooh, to boys. And another term that we'll use is testable. So we can actually look at writing automated tests for verifying that these things are okay. Um, we'll talk about that here in a little bit when we talk about SQL injection. Writing clever code does not protect you. I don't care how clever your code is. It does not matter because somebody's still going to be able to go in there and find issues with it. Okay? So let's start with some of these vulnerabilities. And this one's really neat. This one is a buffer overflow. This is going to be the first vulnerability that we're going to talk about. And I've got a really famous buffer overflow for all of you that we can discuss. And that's going to be Eternal Blue. Everybody heard about Eternal Blue so far? Anybody not hear about Eternal Blue yet? No? Okay. So Eternal Blue is a vulnerability that was found in SMB. 
since SMB version 1.0, which is pretty far back. SMB, uh, it's essentially like a Microsoft file sharing system. So Microsoft has been using this for a long time. And apparently this code was also reused in other places. So it didn't just affect Microsoft software. Okay. But uh, <coughs> if you go to the web page, and you know what, I'm sorry, I didn't announce it. If you actually go to retro 64 oh, XYZ. Mein Gott, ich bin so knapp gerade darunter gefallen. Oh mein Gott. Ich oh, sheesh. But if you go there, you can actually follow along, and I have links. So I have the actual Metasploit. Uh, file here and this is off of GitHub so you can actually follow along and you can use this especially if you're familiar with Metasploit you can actually test this stuff oh TNT is so, here okay and of course we'll get to see Bomber here in a little bit Retro64 XYZ dot GitHub dot IO so back to Eternal Blue. So you can go there, you can check out the Metasploit, you can see everything involving this. But essentially what this was, was a vulnerability in SMB that when you actually exploit this, it allows you to run code on the server. Okay? This was a buffer overflow that allowed for remote code execution. This is a super big deal. In addition, does anybody know where Eternal Blue came from? Who was using this? Who was running around with this? NSA, Can you give me a name? <gasps> Correct. Vault 7 NSA. So the NSA had access to this essentially since SMB version 1.0. And this was a tool that allowed them, if you were running SMB on your Wusste hardware, mein Bett eigentlich grad? which I'm going to take a wild guess and say that the vast majority of people who are running Windows-based servers were also running SMB. Okay, there are there were very few Windows servers that were not running SMB. So well, using this boy. technique, mm. they could send code to the server, and then eventually force that server to run code, run applications to cause things to happen on that server. And there's a bit of a breakdown here. And what is actually happening is there's a mathematical error. And that's where a Z word is subtracted into a word. Now, when I say Z word into a word, for those of you who are not um, Assembly. familiar with programming, in programming, when you were a software developer, especially when you're dealing with something so, like in C++, plus plus, oh, okay, not so much in PHP, but we'll get into that here in a second. If you're working with one of these languages, you actually have to declare a type for your variables, okay? And so what you're doing is you're saying maybe I have an integer. Oh, you have an integer. And that integer is, is <laughs> of a fixed size. And when you declare that integer and say, okay, I have an integer and that integer yeah, is the number eight. If you are declaring a certain name. space in memory and you're putting an eight inside of that space, okay? And that's the most oh, that's right? basic place that we can put it. Um, down up there. <clears throat> so a D word is of a specific size and it's Double actually word. a 32 bit uh, <clears throat> variable. A word is 16 bit. Now, what they're using is a function called mem move. Inside the code, they were using a function. That function was called mem move. And what that does is essentially a copy. Echt like a copy of a variable, and you can move that yeah, variable that coming in memory. Oh. You can say, uh, let's say that the address is address A, and I want to move address A actually to address B. Then we can use mem move to move that variable from A to B. But they need to be the same size. And that's very, very important. And I actually took a copy right here, and you can see mem move. There's a link for those of you who are following along. You can go to the mem move, and you can actually see the function copies the values of num bytes from the location pointed by source to the memory block pointed by destination. Source to destination. Okay? And 
copying takes place as if an intermediate buffer is used, allowing the destination and source to overlap so that you don't have to have a full uh, space between the two memory addresses. But there's a very, very important part that I want to get to down here at the bottom where it says in plain letters, if you want to avoid overflows, the size of the arrays pointed by both the destination and source parameters shall be at least num bytes. That's a really fancy way of saying that those two variables need to essentially be declared as the same size. Okay? You can't min move from int to long int or long int to int. Okay? You can't have one that's really big and then one that's small and try to move them around because they're not going to fit. Think of it almost like Legos. Okay? You have a uh, you have one Lego, you have another Lego. If they're not the same size, they don't line up. Because they were able to locate this error in the code, which has been there for a very long time, they were then later able to um, force the system to execute code. This is a big deal. Remote execution is probably our number one fear in terms of security. If somebody gets access to your server, you can do what amounts to anything. Okay? Are we okay? Do I need to pause? Okay. Now, I want to talk about the buffer. I want to talk about pointers. And I want to give you a few concepts about the buffer before we continue kind of help this set in and to give you all a little bit more um, information about how this works. So a pointer is used to assign the memory address value of a variable to a variable. You're going to use a variable to reference where a variable is being stored in memory. So we're not referencing the content. Hey, but we're actually <coughs> referencing the address. Ich nicht, wie dieses address okay? was das für eine this right here is, is an example. Ich meine, wieso erklärt der Leuten, was ein Pointer ist und geht dann davon aus, dass die wissen, wer irgendein Dude ist, der auf der DEFCON festgenommen wurde und vorher in irgendeiner anderen Folge hat einer im Publikum äh, gesagt, dass er Leute unterrichtet. Also er, das ist jetzt hier ein Vortrag für Lehrkräfte im IT-Security-Bereich, die natürlich wissen, wer dieser Dude XY war, der <lacht> irgendwas mit Turn and Blue zu tun hatte. Ähm, aber er geht davon aus, dass wirklich niemand oder dass halt einige Leute nicht wissen, was ein Pointer ist. Also, aber oder ist das schräg von mir? Ist das, ist das eine andere eine andere Wissens, äh, Wissensgruppe? I don't know. Can dump this into Adam or whatever it is that your compiler slash uh, text editor of choice is. If you want to jump in there and Vim, copy and paste this, dump it into Vim, save it as a, a C file and then use to compile this stuff, you can actually follow along and see this. We declare an integer, var1, and then we use printf, and all we're saying is, is the address of var1 is, and you see that, and, that ampersand right there? We're referencing the memory address, the pointer, okay? And that's a complete line, that's a complete name, okay? And all it does is return an address. And it could be an example like BFF5A200. So that's where bar one currently lives. That's the address. And you can reference these things through pointers. And this is what's happening essentially up here is they're referencing the addresses and they're moving objects by address. Okay? So the next thing is we're going to talk about the buffer. And there's a whole bunch of text here, but let's break the buffer down into something really, really easy. Think of yourself sitting there and you want to eat some candy. So you have a bag of candy, right? And if you were to stick your hand in that bag of candy and just start stuffing your face, your mom would get mad, right? So what do you do? You get a bowl. And you take a handful of candy and you put it in the bowl and then you draw pieces of candy from the bowl. The bowl is our buffer. That right there is where we're supposed to get information from. Because if you don't, you're going to get in trouble. Easy way to break it down, right? So a 
buffer overflow happens when software tries to continue writing past the start or into the buffer. Reaching the okay? We're starting to pick up knickknacks, try to put them in our mouth. Not the candy out of the bowl, coming from somewhere else. So a buffer overflow or buffer underflow happens in either the stack or the heap. I'm going to get to the stack here in a little bit. What happens if we have a problem? This. Whoa, 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 Wie schnell Steintools kaputt gehen. collection, we are the garbage collectors. We have to be explicit 
in how we handle uh, those items that we're creating. You have to delete them if you create it or we create what? If we're adding things to the heap and we're never getting rid of them, what are we doing? We're memory leak. A memory leak. <coughs> Absolutely. As soon as you add something to the heap and you leave it there, well, guess what? It's going to constantly... Okay, so also where have I my portal built? Slowly, it's going to fill up and then it's either going to crash the program, it's going to cause unexpected behavior, Finde ich jetzt fix die Folge, wo ich da hingelaufen bin? Bin ich von hier aus gerade nach da? Nee, von weiter nach da. Ja, man kennt es, Leute, die Memory Leaks haben, aber keine Pointer kennen. Was? <lacht> Hat jetzt... Uh, last time I was dealing with the Minecraft server, which was two years ago, that one was known for having memory leaks. You set up a Minecraft server, you let it run for a while, and if you didn't restart your server, at some point Minecraft is going to bring down. So viel zu Java's toller memory uh, so this is things. A function right here. Garbage so collection. What we're doing? Digga, we're Java is einfach nur Dreck. Counter. And what's that star for? Wie lange bin ich denn gelaufen? Ich weiß es nicht mehr, Leute. Okay, ich schaue, jetzt, ich schaue jetzt ganz kurz, ob ich die Folge finde. Wo ich das Portal gebaut habe. Wann war das denn? Nachdem ich hier im Nether war? Hier war ich noch im Nether und dann die Folge. Jo. Und dann... Ah, okay. Da war ich schon da. Dann ist das noch die nether -Folge. Boah, zwei Stunden ist die Folge. Tschüss. Ah ja, hier. Bin ich im Spawn. Und dann... Am Spawn. Nicht da. Ich wollte eigentlich zu Slime Farm fällt mir gerade auf, aber die erreicht man ja über den Nether. Und den Nether erreicht man nicht mehr wirklich. Oh, das ist eine kritische Nummer. Jetzt bin ich auf der Insel. Okay. Ja, ich komme jetzt hier. Okay, jetzt sind wir gleich auf. Oh, ich habe den Kabelblatt gesetzt. Aha, nice. Oh, jetzt ist jetzt natürlich ein Video im Hintergrund, was nicht verlinkt ist, weil äh, das ist das Video von damals. Das ist Aaron Jones Introduction to Rats, aber es ist auch Aaron Jones, also ich denke, das passt, wenn wir das jetzt im Hintergrund laufen lassen. Ich bin da hinten. Jetzt habe ich den Kabelstone da gesetzt und oh Gott. Ah, ich bin reingefallen, geil. Und dann habe ich den Turm gebaut. Stark. Da ja, bin ich besser auch gekommen, Leute. Ich bin zu schnell. Da vorne. Was ist mein Sound laut da drüben? Like what Microsoft Outlook, 
Ah, ich habe mich überholt. Hier da vorne irgendwo muss es doch sein, oder? Da weiß ich noch, bin ich an der Zeit vorbeigelaufen. Komm schon, ich versuche es Vorspulen hier. Ah, ich hab's. Wunderbar, okay, dann können wir das Video wieder ausmachen. So, wir switchen jetzt wieder zu äh, Programming Defensively. Und, ähm, let's go. Echt? Was der Hell? Das wusste ich nicht. Ich dachte, wenn ein Programm so schließt. What? Warte, da muss ich mal kurz zurückspulen. Ich dachte, wenn man ein Programm killt. Das ist mir neu. Als ob, das ist ja ultra krass. Minecraft, Minecraft in C. So the next problem is the software is going to bring things in, right? We need some sort of information for that software to work. Sometimes we're really, really Schon lucky. funny, dass er echt Minecraft gerade hier als Beispiel gebracht hat, oder? It doesn't require any kind of input. Okay. Als ob es nicht irgendein anderes Programm gibt, das man Release hat. You might have a user. Providing input, maybe a form, 
like input box, some place where they can stick something into the computer, right? You might have an uploaded file. This one's big with WordPress people. Once WordPress gives people the opportunity to upload files to a server, man, people get real creative with that when they want to attack your WordPress server. Maybe you're piping data into the program, command line interface. You have a CSV file that you're going to pipe directly into your application. Or maybe the data is sent over a network, a REST call. You wrote some software and it's going to go out to the internet and contact the server and pull down some information, bring it in, and then work on that data. Okay? No matter what it is or where this data comes from, you cannot trust this data. You just can't. Just make the assumption that at no time this information is ever good. I don't care if you wrote it. I don't care if your mom wrote it, your dog wrote it, anybody. No matter who it is, you cannot trust that information. So what do you have to do? You have to do what's called either input validation or sanity checking is another good one. And so what are we actually doing there? Well, we're looking at the data to see if the data is correct. We don't want to just give you an opportunity. When I say, what is your name? Put your name in this box. Well, maybe your name is 256 characters long. And I'm only looking for 255. And then what happens? We're trying to put more information into a spot than that spot can hold in memory, right? And what happens? The person crashes. Or how about WordPress? They did a huge update not too long ago in which they had to scramble to add support for emojis to WordPress. You all know why they had to add emoji support? They had to add emoji support because the database was not designed to handle emojis. And they would literally crash or delete the entire database if you started adding emojis into it. You could corrupt the whole database could cause all kinds of problems depending on what you were putting into the database. So somebody would open up a text box, start putting emojis inside of that text box, hit submit, and they would blow the whole site out. And that was such a like emergency thing. We kept it secret. And the way that they announced it was to tell everybody, surprise, we've added emoji support to WordPress. Look at how great we are. You can use the poop emoji now. Isn't that fantastic, everybody? But that wasn't the actual issue they were trying to solve. <laughs> the issue they were trying to solve was the fact that those emojis were causing problems with the database. And it was interesting, too, because the guy who found this problem, he actually contacted WordPress and was cool about it. He was like, look, look what I can do. Here's the script you can run. I can essentially destroy anything. I can cause all kinds of problems on the internet right now, and they asked him to keep it secret, and he did. The guy yeah. followed through, the European guy. So that's very lucky, right? To have somebody who sat down and had all of these, essentially the world open to him, the whole world was his oyster, he figured out how to break something that he could have done horrible things, and instead of sitting down and breaking all of this stuff, what this guy did was to sit down, reach out to the people at WordPress, and hook them up. That was a super cool thing. And of course, I talk about that here. Um, and that'll get into SQL injection and stuff like that here in a little bit. If you're just a real basic recap here, you're going to accept any information from anybody. If your program has to accept any information from anywhere, you need to sanitize it. In addition to that, you never know what's going to happen on your system or your program or so, whatever it is that you're working on. So when you output information or you provide that information somewhere else, Wo you lang should bin ich sanitize gegangen? that as well. You should make sure that there's some kind of sanity check on both input as well here? as output. You're looking for problems. You're looking to make sure certain information does not go out. Think about it. If I need to accept your social security number through my form, should my program ever be allowed to print out your social security number if I am not supposed to print it out? No. So I should be checking to 
make sure that at no time am I accessing those social security numbers and then running them to output. When you're developing software, a lot of this is very logical and it's going to consist of you sitting down with a pad and a, a pen and sitting there and saying, what do I need to accept? What do I need to send out? And then what do I need to make sure goes nowhere? And what do I need to make sure never comes in? When you design a form, you're going to set yourself up. Ah, I have mich da irgendwo am Rand hochgegraben. Jetzt weiß ich wieder. Whatever it is, but you've got some dates. Yeah, you've got some times. You got some names. Ich sollte das wahrscheinlich bei Tag machen. Geht die Sonne gerade auf oder unter? Uh, like think about names. Anybody here know anybody who has an emoji or a uh, like a exclamation mark in their name? Well, it depends on what Anything name. Like User name for sure. No, right? Most of us don't. But is it possible that that could happen? Maybe. Oh my God. What about numbers? You and I, probably none of us in here have a number in our name. But somebody could be Richard the Third, and instead of putting in Richard the Third and spelling the whole thing out, what if he just puts in Richard Three? That's my name, Richard Three. So potentially, you have to think about who you're going to handle, who are you going to cater to. I have a coworker who has four names. I have three names. Most of us have three names. If you go down to the DMV, generally you're looking at different forms that have what? First name, middle name, last name. No more, no less. So for somebody like him, he has a big issue when he goes down to some place and tries to use a form and has to put in four names. You know how most of these places actually shorten it? They take the first initials of the two middle names and then use that as a name. So like Aaron B C and then the last name would be Habe ich noch irgendwo hingespritzt hier mit meinen Item? Try to find ways of shortening things so that it fits. Okay? Hammer alles. Your job is to figure out what you will support, what you will not support. And Um, we talk about it for a little bit here later on, but a lot of what you're going to be doing, especially uh, when you're dealing with things like a potential to run into um, social engineering, is giving information to your user. If I accept your social security number through my webpage, then I should have something that says, if a person calls your phone at your home, we will never ask for your social security number. What have I just done? I have informed my user that I am accepting the social security number and we're adding stars to it doing all the different stuff that you're supposed to do and so on and so forth. And then we are warning them that if somebody does call and ask for that social, don't give it to them. We don't need it again. Once we have it in a database, it's secure. We're not giving it up. We'll get to that here in a second. This one's fun and this one's really cool and I really like race conditions. And that sounds weird and probably kind of a little bit sad, but race conditions uh, occur when multi-threaded applications attempt to access a shared resource without any kind of protection or locking. If you're taking notes, locking is a term that's very important whenever you want to learn about race conditions because you can actually lock a thread to work singularly with like a function without allowing another one to step in and take over or stomp. Stomp is another term you'll hear. So let's consider the following code. What I have right here is, can I make it bigger? Is that, is, are we frozen? We're gonna give it a second here. Okay, not good. Yep. Okay, keine Ahnung, ich hoffe ich habe alles. Again, this is not an introduction to programming. This is just programming concepts and some of the cybersecurity related stuff that we need to worry about. So, but good news is that, are we, are we cool? Okay. So this right up here, this little line of code, a couple lines right here, this is a for loop. Okay. And Pick it X. looks pretty yeah. basic, right? All I'm doing is 
I'm declaring an integer right here, int space i equals zero. So I said, hey, I need some space for an integer. Make that integer i and assign it a value of zero. And then I say for as long as i is less than this huge number, right, then go ahead and do i plus plus. So we're incrementing, yep. And that's all we're doing right there for that for loop. And then I'm saying x, maybe I've already declared x further up. Ah oh, yeah, ich habe schon viel cobblestone gesetzt, deswegen one. So yeah. let's say that I declared x, made it a zero, so we're doing plus one, and for every single loop through this, we're adding one to x. Really simple, right? However, I want you to think about what would happen if we have two threads attempting to access the above code. That is when we start implementing a race condition. If you have two threads attempting to access the same function, this is where we're going to stomp all over ourselves. Those threads involved can be at any point in the process at any time. This is really important. This is where we're going to start having a problem. This is where x plus 1 can quickly become any number you can possibly think about. Because x is even able to be changed between time of reading x and writing x. So we have no control over x anymore. So we have more than one thread hitting this code. So let's break it down. Thread 1 reads x and x equals 7. Thread 1 is going to add 1 to x. We're going to do our increment, right? And that means that we're going to assign x equals 8. That's what thread 1 is attempting to do. Well, during that time, thread 2 steps in, reads x, and says, oh yeah, x is 7. Sounds good. I see x is 7. Even though thread 1 has already said, I want to assign x equals 8. So at this point, thread 1 is under the impression that x is supposed to be 8. Thread 2 just stepped in, still sees thread uh, still sees x as 7. Is everybody still following me? Okay. Thread 1 then writes 8 to x. But thread 2 still thinks that x is 7. So now thread 2 adds 1 to x, and what does x become? 8. And then thread 2 writes 8 to x. So we just stomped all over x repeatedly. And now imagine that you have more and more threads getting involved, more and more numbers being added to this thing. It's seen x is 8, x is 9, x is 1,000, x is 1, and it's going back and forth. That number is never going to be correct. We're never going to reach the point that we want to be. It's a compounding problem that only gets worse as more threads are introduced. You start adding threads, you start breaking things. Uh, I had a student who his... Um, I'm going to use the word dream. His dream was to become a game programmer. So he started learning C++ because he wanted to design a game engine. And I remember him sitting down and showing me his game engine. And what he was doing was using threads. One thread was being used for the graphical user interface, and then another thread was being used for the game itself. And he was attempting to use multiple threads in order to work on this project that he had. But it was actually moving on the screen and break. He had all kinds of tearing and a whole bunch of other stuff. And I, I sat down and I asked him, are you using multiple threads? And he said yes. And I immediately said, well, you need to look into locking because this is where your your problem is. You have different things being touched by different um, threads. And lo and behold, by the end of class, he pulled me over and he said, hey, check this out again. And he had it fixed. But when you start working with threads is when you have to be much more careful your logic, as well as paying attention to what those threads are potentially doing. Um, one other thing, for those of you who do any kind of gaming, have you ever heard that it's better to have a very, very fast processor than it is to have one with multiple cores or threads? Have you all heard that before? A couple of you? Okay. This is what's going on in terms of people don't want to code lots and lots of threads because it's hard. It is. It's hard to learn this stuff and it's hard to make sure all of this stuff works all at once. So for a lot of these very um, very intricate systems that are doing a lot of math and 
all over the place, they are essentially running off of maybe one or two threads. Nowadays, we're starting to see more and more people move towards multi-threaded applications and getting all that stuff in there. But even today, you'll still find applications that only use one thread. Uh, in addition to that, just as a, and I'm not pushing AMD, but have you all heard about Threadripper? Mm -hmm. Oh, got some damage on Threadripper. I'm super excited about Threadripper. When we're moving towards having 32 threads now, and consumer computers, more, yeah, that's classic. The amount of parallel processing that you can do is getting absolutely insane. And Intel is already like, super upset about Threadripper and they've said that they're going to throw down the gauntlet here shortly and so stuff is supposed to get even faster. Uh, and a lot of this has to do with the fact that essentially we're reaching sort of this apex of how fast processors are. So what we're having to do is we're moving out to being able to handle more things at once as opposed to climbing. Now we're just spreading out. So here's our next one. Access control failure. Everybody here has worked in access control life cycle. Everybody. There's not a single person here, I am absolutely convinced, who has not put a username and a password into a web page at some point and hit submit. That is access control. If you're watching this on YouTube right now, you're part of the access control life cycle. Wieso? Because you went to YouTube clicked on this video, and you can see the video, and that means that YouTube has granted you access to view this video, and if you didn't have access to it, what's one of the potential warnings that they could give you? If you don't log in, we can't tell whether you're 18 years of age or older. Yeah, but so is this video 18? No, it is this video. I'm sure everybody's seen that before. You've got to give us a username, got to give us a password, and give us information about you, or you're not going to be allowed to see something. This is part of privilege escalation. When you are looking at an application, what are you really trying to do when you want to break in? You want access and privilege to do things you're not supposed to do. That's what you're looking for. When we talk about security vulnerabilities, the vast majority of those vulnerabilities that we're looking for are either privilege related for the exploits necessary to gain more privilege. We want access to more things. Anybody ever hear the term root? Root the box? I want to get access to a server. I'm going to root the server. And then once I have access to that, I have elevated privileges. And now I can do whatever it is that I want to do on that system. Uh, for those of you who have ever done any kind of like system administration, what usually happens when you want to start a service? You sudo up or you run sudo to start the service. The service connects or does whatever work that Irgendwie is necessary. The, the open and the custom bench of the first side to go. It relinquishes the privileges to go down to the lowest denominator of what it needs to access, run, and do its job, right? You don't want one of those applications running sudo the entire time. Um, another example. Has anybody ever heard about the guy who got his entire Linux box crypto locker? No? So I don't have a link to this dude, but what ended up happening after the dust settled, after this guy said, I got crypto lockered through my web browser on a Linux box, wiped out my whole home directory, wiped up the whole system. Okay? What actually happened was is he sudoed up and ran Firefox. And there was an exploit in Firefox that gave whoever accessed that exploit the ability to run code on the system. And so somebody ran CryptoLocker on his system, had root access, started it, forward slash, worked its way down, CryptoLockered the whole box. Because what was he doing? He was running his root. So when I tell you most of this stuff is about privilege escalation, what do we really care about? We care about running as that lowest common denominator. Our user should not be root. For some of us, our user shouldn't even be able to sudo up. Okay? We want to log into a user to do specific work or to do specific things, and that user should not have the capability to move up into sudo. Uh, I have 
a, well, I have a bunch of servers. Everybody who knows me knows that I'm a real big Scaleways guy, and I think that everybody should have a remote Linux box somewhere out in the world and so on and so forth, right? I also run a server that's far, and that server is the only way that you can come back into my home network, okay? So I have to go from wherever my computer is all the way out into Europe through SSH, and then once I hit there, then that is the only box that can SSH all the way back into my home, and it gets dropped into a box that can't pseudo up, that user has only very limited read access to some resources on my network. And what is that user allowed to do? It can pull down like videos and pictures and all my fun stuff, but it can only read, can't write, can't delete, can't do anything else. It just has read access. So I can grab that information and go throw it out on that server or I can stream it back all the way to my computer through SSH tunneling. There's things that I can do with that information, but I can't get rid of it, can't destroy it, can't break it, can't do anything. Okay? Now that's a lot of work for it to be set up like that, that initial, um, I guess, brainstorming of deciding what are the things that I'm worried about, what kind of vulnerabilities am I concerned about. Oh, have ich meine Schienen verloren? You know, I can only SSH in. I'm not running any kind Scheiße, of like sieht echt so aus, als hätte ich meine Schienen verloren. Like Because why? Because I'm worried so about geil. privilege escalation. The less things that this box has access to the less vulnerabilities that it has, the less software that's running, the harder it is for you to be able to do something with that box. Could somebody get in there and find all my anime? Sure, maybe they could. And then they're going to have a really cool collection of anime. Oh well. But it doesn't mean that they got into that box and then destroyed all of my records. It doesn't mean that they destroyed all of my uh, documentation for like my car or anything like that. What people want to do is called CRUD. And that's another uh, acronym that you want to keep in mind. Read. CRUD you can create, read, update, or delete. Okay? That's our concern, is CRUD. What can they create? What can they read? What can they update? What can they delete? If I get into a system and I've broken into that system, terms what's raus, one of the first things that I'm going to want to go in there and do? Start messing with the logs, right? Updating logs, changing logs, you can cover my tracks. So I, don't I, don't I don't want you to know what I was doing. I don't want you to know what access I had. So I'm updating logs. Maybe I'm creating files. Uh, we've talked about this before previously, but people break into servers. Why? Because they want to be able to put their kitty porn up. They want to put illegal content on your server and get that hosted out to people. And then if the FBI comes knocking, who are they going to come knocking? They're going to come knocking for you because you're the one who owns the server, not the guy who uploaded all that crap to it. We're also going to talk about crypto. And this is even worse than no crypto. No crypto is probably not that bad when you think about it because we know that it's not there. We will treat that data differently. We will act differently. We will have different concerns than if we are under the impression that our crypto is good, our crypto is strong, our crypto is working, and then we find out, actually that crypto sucks. It doesn't work, it doesn't do anything. And that whole time that you were just slinging that data all around, well guess what, somebody else was able to sit there and just decrypt this stuff as it comes over the wire, and they could look at all of it. Because us, under the impression that it was safe and secure, treated that data differently, and I guarantee you, When you go to a web page and up in the corner it's got a little key lock and it says SSL encryption and so on and so forth and this thing is protected, I almost guarantee every person in this room has so far been trained to look at that and go, yeah, I can put a username and password in that box. And then when we see no crypto and the thing has a little warning and it says there's no crypto available off of this web page, most of us are now trained to look at that and go, nope, you don't get my information. Why don't you go out and get a less encrypted? Even if you're the poorest sysadmin in the world, you can still have a less, less encrypt. So you can still add crypto to that web page, and that's how we see it. Not thinking about the fact that cryptography is not a guarantee of content. Cryptography means the 
those contents are encrypted. It does not mean that the contents are true, that they're real, that they're safe, that they're coming from who you thought they came from. None of those are a guarantee with crypto. The only guarantee that you really, even then, you don't really have this guarantee, but the only thing that we can say on a whole that cryptography represents is that the information should be encrypted and nobody should be able to read it. Which again, that's false. It's not 100% true, but in general. We're, we're using a generalization here because we can get way into the weeds with crypto and we can get way into the weeds with SSL. But guess what? The bad guys screw this up too. We've all heard, right, of versions of Crypto Locker that were released into the wild and the crypto was no good and people could recover their data without having to pay. It always shows up in the news. This variant or this version of this Crypto Locker tool failed. It does not provide uh, any kind of good crypto for that information that's being captured and then somebody can come in, write a script, and they get their data back. What? If you're going to implement any kind of crypto, ah, that's uh, one of the main did. recommendations that you get is no, don't roll your own. Don't create your own cryptographic um, algorithms. Don't create any of that stuff. Always work with what's available. Work with the tools that have already been tried, tested, proven. Uh, that's generally <sighs> a good, um, good advice. Now, that doesn't mean that you can't work with crypto. Like uh, if you do any kind of PHP programming, there is actually like a PHP encrypt and a PHP decrypt that's a function and you can encrypt things and then decrypt those things. You can use those, like that's what they mean. You can use the functions that are made available to you. You can write software using the code that's tried and tested by like OWASP and all these other groups. That's fine. That's not what they mean when they say don't roll your own crypto. What they're talking about is writing the actual encryption algorithm that's being developed to do the encryption itself. Now we're going to get into social engineering. And this is where it gets tough. Okay? Because at the end of the day, no matter how hard you work to make your software secure, no matter how much effort put in to defending your database, to defending your network, to defending your server, any and all of these things, I don't care what you're doing to try to protect yourself. If you as a user make a mistake, or you as a user give out this information, you're cooked. It doesn't matter. You have the best crypto in the world, but if your users sit down and hand over their username and password to somebody who picks up the phone and says that they're from Microsoft support, However, as a developer, right? This is where education admin. comes in. This is why we have classes like this. This is why when I'm speaking to people on behalf of the police department, I go out there and I tell them, hey, if you're a little kid and you're interested in doing Minecraft, and that's great and that's super cool, but hey, kids, make sure that you're not putting your picture online. Don't be going out there giving out your username and password. Don't tell people where your parents live. Because some of these people don't know. They're either young, or they're not experienced with it, or they don't know where these things can be used as weapons or to harm someone. Again, going back to some of my earlier comments, how does it help us? How does it hurt us? We can have fun with it, or we can hurt somebody with it. I can create a tool that's going to harm you, or I can create a tool that will let you have some fun. But it's all off of the computer. We need, as developers, whether you're a web application developer, whether you write software, whether you're doing uh, any kind of integrated or um, any kind of development. You know what, just any. You need to start educating your users. When they fill out a form, you need to warn them. You need to let them know within the form. And I know it seems redundant when you have users who get really upset because they have to have a letter, a number, their password can't be the letter A, and they get 
super upset about it. And, oh, you're wasting my time. Why can't I just use the letter A? It's just my bank account. It's not like you guys won't pay me back anyways if they steal my money. When you are dealing with folks, it does help to make them feel empowered, to give them information that says, your password must be this link, this link, this link. And then at the bottom, just link them to the, the government. If you'd like to know more about why we choose to make our passwords of this strength, here's a little link. Click on it, it takes them to the FBI with a little breakdown of, your password's important. Feel good stuff. Some people will never click on it, some people will get upset, and other people will just use, forgot my password every single time. Houston. And that may be just their info. But for every person that you can help or empower, that's important. And of course, this is getting into that touchy-feely, like, oh, we're software developers. Like, I should just be able to write code. If you're too stupid Was to do this, this well, oh here? well. Warte mal. But how Was many people der Block da? here Whoa. deal with people who have said, I've got a camera that I went out and bought, and I brought it in my house, and that's my security camera, and all I did was turn it on, and now I can connect it with my phone. And all that stupid networking stuff that said I was going to have to do, I don't have to do that. I, right? I see a bunch of head shaking. You have that relative that said, oh, all that internet stuff that you're getting paid for, that's dumb. Press a button on your cell phone, boom, there it is. Video of my house. And then you have to sit there and you have to explain to them, actually, that video of you walking around in your house in your underwear is first being shipped off to China, where they're using it for things, whatever it is that they decided that they want to use it for. And then that data is being shipped all the way back overseas, and then it ends up on your phone. And in addition to that, your phone or that device in your home is being used to crunch numbers, break crypto, mine Monero, or whatever else it is that they've decided that that system is going to be used for. Or you get a knock on the door and a letter delivered to you that says, hey, we're cutting off your internet because your whole house is part of a botnet. And so you can't be on the internet anymore until you fix it. Any of those things could be potentially going on. And it's real hard as a developer to try to explain that to somebody who is not developer-minded when you tell them, yeah, that $99 or $150 that you just spent on this kit for your home is still being used by somebody else. Somebody has yeah. Ah, geil! It's being deployed Jetzt geht dann the TNT hoch. And they look at you oh, and they warte. Is it hoch gegangen? Sind meine Items right, noch da oder nicht? Jungs! What have I done? <laughs> <laughs> but a lot of people don't want to hear it. That's oh, where man. the whole thing comes in. We as developers, Scheiße. Developers, we as whatever it is that we're doing, we have to sit down and have to start making computers. And guess what? There are new kids being made every single day, and this is not a waste because maybe that one person that you were worried about has just learned to click on that little FBI button, read, and then make their password. But there's another person who's just turned in 12 that's going to head over to that web page, and they've never heard any of this stuff before, and it's going to continuously be a benefit as it turns through new people. And I know I commented about the social security part, but let's talk about that again because this is important. Because what is what is toxic? Data is toxic. What do people love to hoard? Data. Whatever your information is. They want information about your house, your car, your shoes, your what you know, color shirt you like to wear, any of this information they want to keep it. Yeah, ich werde so hart meine Mending Pickaxe verlieren. Das gibt's ja gar nicht. Anybody wanna give me a database that got hit? Oh, Mensch, ich hab gerade eine Mending Pickaxe verloren. Ich hab gerade eine Mending Pickaxe verloren. Ich hab gerade eine Mending Pickaxe verloren. Ashley Madison, Toxic Information, right? They promised, they literally promised, hey, you slip me a fiver and I'll delete your name. And they took their fiver and they didn't delete the name. <lacht> Toxic information. Not just toxic, purposefully toxic. Can you imagine what could be done with that information? Well, guess what? I'll tell you. People killed themselves. Marriages were ended. Divorce court went different ways. There's three items right there. Okay? They had priests. 
whose names were on that list with their address and with all the other information, and people found out that they were sitting there searching Ashley Madison from their parish, who decided to off themselves, didn't have to face the shame of having their information put out there. Okay? Toxic information. Harmful data. Again, social engineering. How do you tell people the things that you're doing on the computer are harmful to you and others? And if you are not educated about these things, you are going to cause yourself or others problems. And I, I have met people, when you tell them, hey, that device in your house is being used to DDoS somebody's server, they go, I don't care, it doesn't affect me. My computer's not slow. Screw them. Yikes. There are people who are either willfully ignorant or just don't care. So we're also dealing with those folks. software developer, be a security guy, be whatever you got to be, but let people know. And then here's another really powerful one. Failure to expect attacks. It'll never happen to me. I'll never be involved in that. You know what tools I don't use still to this day? Won't touch them. Adobe. You know mm. why? They burned me twice. Twice? Eh? Adobe got hit, and I had one of those stupid Adobe Cloud accounts. So I got hit in the Adobe Cloud account, and all my information got leaked to the internet. And if you go and you check for leaks and you start throwing my email and my information in, you can actually find my data in that stupid Adobe account. And then they send out an email that said, oh, everything's cool. We fixed it all. Don't worry about it. You can go right back to using Photoshop and using these video editing tools, and everything's going to be okay. Adobe has got your back. And like a moron, well, I had to cancel my credit card. I had to do all this other stuff. But I really need access to Photoshop, and i got to be able to work on all these different things. You know what? I'm going to go ahead and sign right back up for Adobe. And no more than a few months later, what do I get? Hey, just so you know, Adobe got popped again. All your information right back out on the Internet. Ha-ha, <laughs> cancel your credit card immediately. Thanks, Adobe. You guys literally kept toxic data in your server, credit card information, my name, date of birth, all of this other data, you kept that toxic data, you got popped, leaked it all to the internet, instead of sitting down and saying, you know what, how do we get better at PCI compliance? How do we get rid of this toxic data? How do we remove these dangers from our users? Somebody just said, we'll just restart the server. They won't come back. It'll be fine. <laughs> Once we bounce that database up and down, that whoever's connected to the REST API or whatever it was that they were plowing through that thing with, they'll just disconnect and they will never reconnect ever again. And they just throw all the data right back out on the internet. Expect attacks. If you want to get Super Harry Potter in here, constant vigilance, right? Pick whatever it is that you want to pick to get yourself in that mindset, but understand that at all times the tools help. They give you access to Photoshop. The tools hurt. They force you to go out and cancel your credit card or else somebody's going to go and do stupid stuff with your money. There's a lot of web, um, there's a lot of businesses. There are a lot of people in government. Can anybody think of a government agency that got hit, had all their toxic data leaked out onto the internet, cause a whole bunch of us problems, especially those of us who are either in the military or working with the military. Anybody want to give me a three-letter OPM? You know how that worked out for them? Essentially, they spent that much money on security. Zero dollars. No money. They spent no money on security. They found a guy in their systems, saw that he was operating with the computer and when people said, we got to take this network down, we got to figure out what's going on, we need to resolve these issues. You know what they did? They said, it's cool, we'll watch. It's not going anywhere. He's just rooting around in the system. He's not going to pull any data out. And they went with a hands-off approach. I want you to imagine for a second that you're in your home and you hear 
boom, and in goes your front door. The guy walks in, he's got a bag in one hand, Geiler mask Vergleich. on, and a gun in the other, and he's just cruising around your house, just looking. How many of you are going to look over at your husband or wife? And don't worry, I'm talking to the camera too. How many of you are just going to look over and be like, hey, it's cool, he hasn't picked anything up, just leave him alone. He's just cruising around. Just looking. Hey, it's got some bits no. like, eh? Right? <laughs> no Nobody's gonna sit there and say, it's fine for you to be in my network. It's fine for you to be in my computer. It's fine for you to be in my house. It's not fine. But that's what they did. And then, they aren't even the ones that sounded the alarm. It was a contractor who found out that their information was now out. There was traffic moving. There was data being pulled down. People were able to find this information on the internet. And that's when somebody stepped in and was like, well, I guess it's time for us to tell somebody. And guess what? By that point, CRUD, right? Create, read, update, delete. What happened? Somebody in the database started updating records, deleting records, reading the records. There are there is a potential right now that in the OPM database, there are individuals registered as retirees of the U.S. military who do not exist, but there is money being paid out to these individuals. And they have no way of verifying whether that information is true or not. Okay? So there is potential right now that within that database, somebody has added a guy said that he's a retiree, Boy, and somebody is collecting money for that retired individual, the person does not exist. And there is no way for them to go in there and verify. Because what are you going to do? Cut off everybody in the U.S.'s retirement? Are you going to just shut it all down? Hey, thanks for your service, but we got to shut this down because our database sucks. Go reset your credit card. Again. And then they go, what, lockstep, hand in hand with Adobe, off into the sunset? No. It's not going to happen. So they pay it out. Software development for penetration testers this is where it starts getting cool, right? Now that we're all super depressed and extra mad, getting ready to go home and get on the internet and start posting, right? <laughs> we're going to go hit those forums. Oh, no! Lots of applications available, okay? Penetration testers. I've made lists. Hey, Leute, bald ist mein Essen alle. Welche Items versuche ich überhaupt zu retten? Da ist eine uh, fucking TNT-Maschine drüber gewesen. Um, oh my goodness. Okay, uh, ich würde sagen, wir machen hier mal einen kurzen Cut, Leute. Und wir sehen uns in der nächsten Folge. IP ist 1.9.2.2. Uh, 127.134 ist auch in der Beschreibung und uh, Link zu Aaron Jones ist auch in der Beschreibung. Wir sehen uns in der nächsten Folge.